One of the things that resonated with me that I thought just really good content, I'd love our audience just to hear about briefly, was your five components of healthy financial relationships between couples. Uh, I think you called it the five C's, I believe. But do you could you mind spending a few minutes on those? Yeah, just a, just a little. Heather and I are laughing because little inside joke. We we really um, we're gonna go through the five C's, but we we secretly hate the five C's. Not the content itself, but oh, the title. We love the content of the five C's, but we, like we, the, title. the five C's need, need a rebrand. Yeah. So if anyone, oh yeah, listeners, we got to come up with something better. Yeah, I think your listeners have a better. The C is for cheesy, I guess, but we're. Yeah. we're Content. We're working on working on a better way to display that, but let's let's dive okay, into we'll that. Just do the, we'll just do the five big ideas. How about that? Yeah, five ideas around couples and money. Sure. Um, we really want to start out with with connection, right? Starting the conversation with your partner around what your money beliefs and behaviors are. There are a lot of questionnaires available online. You can go find them. We liked one from Therapist Aid. It was very very helpful in guiding the conversation. But find find a resource like that so you guys can begin writing down. Um, you know, some answers to questions around what your money beliefs are. It's important. And that that's the, has to be the important first step because understanding is mm-hmm. really, is really what's, what the takeaway is from that. Um, we need you guys to really understand where you're coming from. Um, when it comes to money, understand some of those values and, um, only then can you begin to even consider compromise, to even consider planning for the future. If you haven't really taken the time to understand uh, what, are, what are we really talking about here? So that's why the first step is to start the conversation with some of those, you know, with some of those uh, money beliefs and understanding them better from your partner. Yeah. And, and is that, and, and I guess a lot of that has to do with your, your history and your upbringing and the way. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And that's why um, our book will begin that way as well. Um, we're going to really talk about your past yeah. and uh, and and what types of behaviors, what types of values, um, you know, you carry with you to this day. Because yeah. if you don't give your partner a look under the hood right. as to how you, then then how are you how do you, can you expect them to really um, understand where you're coming from today and honor it and respect it? Because right. you can't just reject you can't just flat out reject uh, reject today. A value. To, yeah. Yeah. A value. Right. yeah. Right. A money belief. That's affixed to somebody's value system. Right. But if you don't understand it, you know, you're setting yourself up uh, for, for difficulty. Yep. Okay. So that was, that was idea number one. Okay. What was yeah, number connection. two? <laughs> First C, connection. Yeah. Second, second C would be communication. Um, I think it's important to schedule dedicated times to have these tough conversations. Communicating well requires communicating distraction free um, and, and and really scheduling a time and a forum that works best for you. So if you know that that to be distraction free and to not be stressed and to not feel rushed, you can't do this. Here's a funny example. I'll give you a great example of what not to do. If Doug comes upstairs from Doug, Doug was working on some sort of like budgeting spreadsheet recently, and he was very proud of himself. And we had agreed that we would schedule some time apropos of our second C communication. We'd schedule some time to talk about it later in the week. But Doug was so excited that he had worked on the budget spreadsheet that he marched upstairs to me while I was making dinner for the two kids at 530 at night when everyone's running around. They just got home and the TV is blaring left and right. Yeah. Yeah. He goes you would be so excited about this spreadsheet that I just made. And I said, great, let's talk about it at our meeting. And he said, okay, but can I just, can I just tell you about this one? And he starts like launching into it. That is not what you want to do. Okay. You're creating anxiety. Uh, It's, it's actually a deterrent from, from having a full, fulsome conversation at another time. So communicate in a way that works best for you both. I highly suggest you turn off your phones um, and just, Put yourself in a in the best position possible to listen. Yeah, some pre planning around that. So, are you suggesting that maybe um, Valentine's Day dinner is not the time for this? Is that maybe? Yeah, we may have suggested that in CNBC. Yeah. Uh, this I thought, time. yeah, that's where I stole money, that from. Yeah, money dates are an amazing way to set the table and communicate well with your partner. But special occasions like Valentine's Probably Day, not a good idea. Maybe you yeah. keep a big picture and leave the spreadsheets at yeah. home. Some people have no problem doing this over a meal, you know, casually and, you know, a drink or two. <laughs> um, but for for me, I'll give you an example. Uh, I like to walk. You know, I like we both to. Love it. Yeah, we like walking. I can give Heather myself. I can't I can't go. Yeah, I, I guess I could run away from her. 
<laughs> but I can't really get distracted. You know, for me, it really locks me in. And before we move on from communication into the next one, you know, one of the central things here is, is putting yourself in a position to listen. Mm. You know, this is really where people not only are communicating, but they need to be heard. Right? You really need to find that space to listen to them. And then you can get into the next one, which is contribution. All right. Yeah, right. Um, we need each other. We need each partner to understand what their contributions are to the relationship, not just financial contributions. It goes so far beyond that. It's also about their personal contributions as well. Um, I like doing this from two approaches, writing down what you believe your contributions are and also writing down what you think your partner's contributions are which could get dicey if you get some things right or wrong there. But I like it coming from both sides there. Um, it's very not, important yeah, with contribution. Right. And and something that I think we as a society do a bad job at is limiting the idea of a contribution to the person who's financially contributing to the household. And that's, that is something that we are trying to change through our work and through our book. Um, yeah. We are expanding expanding the idea of what a contribution is and not affixing it to the salary that comes in. And, right. and, um, and so we really, when we say contribution, because what happens in the household allows for the other partner to, to be able to financially contribute. And so it's very important to us that all contributions are honored and kind of placed on the table evenly and right. redistributed if need be. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the ability in the communication part to sort of die to your own agenda is really important. But on the contribution part, it's also, I guess, important to honor each contribution, as you mentioned, regardless of whether it's financial or other uh, contribution. So very I think, helpful. And that's also where you see, start to see like, like disparate, um, you start to see where things aren't equitable in a relationship and uh, how people feel about um, spending and saving and who gets to make the financial decisions in a relationship by looking critically at what the contributions are, maybe looking at it differently for maybe the first time. I think that you're kind of setting yourself up for the next step because you're kind of both putting, um, you're, you're putting everything out there, right? And, right. and you're honoring it. And and maybe someone who didn't feel like they had a voice before, maybe a partner who felt like, or that their voice wasn't heard or honored quite as, as uh, much as their partners um, right. might kind of get their voice back. That's, that, that's the, that's the step where we see that happen. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. A huge piece of it. And then we're going to talk about collaboration and this is a lot of the technical stuff. Um, you got to have some data supporting all of this if we're going to be talking about money. In this case, we're talking about knowing where things are. A net worth table does that, a list of all the assets, where the, you know, what's in the accounts, their values, as well as liabilities, what you owe. People need to understand where everything is. And they also need to understand how money is coming in and out of their life. So this is everything from, you know, your budgeting or your cash flow table. They need to understand how money is made and how money is spent. That way you can have productive conversations around whether or not what you're doing with your money is what you agree on that should be done. You know, if you feel that you're not getting a lot of value out of going out four nights a week or ordering, you know, food in um, and you want to pull back on that, you can have a productive conversation as opposed to just assuming the goal isn't to shoot from the hip when it comes to talking about money. It's to have concrete, you know, data and evidence of uh, to support what it is that you're talking about. So this is where people need to get involved. Granted, look, in, in our household, look, Heather's married to a financial planner. Um, there's households where one person is usually the numbers person or the CFO. That's fine. But I just want to say this. Everyone has a responsibility to understand a baseline level of what is going on in the household, in their financial lives. Not mm -hmm. everybody needs to be Warren Buffett. Not everyone needs to be the CFO, but everyone does have the responsibility to know how much cash is in the account, how to access those accounts, where they are, what bank, you know, right. that, that needs to be done in order for there to be um, really a, a team game being played. So collaboration, you know, no, no team game is played without a team. So you guys are a team and need to do that. Gotcha. Okay, great. And I guess there's one more. one more. There's one more C, one more C, consistency. Uh, you know, this really should be done 
money meetings should be done on at least a quarterly basis. If you can handle it, you should do it more than that. I mean, don't, I wouldn't say that every single day you should be discussing numbers. And that goes back to that same idea that we wrote about in our money, uh, in our Valentine's day piece, like not every day is meant for this, but scheduling at least a quarter. If you can do it more often, great. If you feel like that's important to you, um, look at changes in your net worth as well as your spending versus your budget, um, and discuss what's working and not working and, and be willing to be nimble with it and say, you know what, like we may have pulled back in this one area and I feel really constrained. Is there something else we can look at for next month or next quarter? Uh, because I'm not really feeling good. Like the check-ins allow you to tweak what you're doing without those subtle, like, because what, what we often would see when you don't check in and don't communicate that openly about it that frequently, what you'd see is kind of microaggressions building up, mm. resentment building right. up. Feeling yeah. like, well, I'm not, I'm not that sure that that these changes we made are feeling good for me. And then when you don't have an opportunity to speak about them, you just kind of it builds up inside. It yeah. builds up inside of you. It festers exactly. So yeah. that's the last one. K keeping this going, you know, as Doug always says, like you're going to be sore the first time you go to the gym and you and you do reps, but when you've done it every Thursday morning for a whole year, you're going to yeah. feel good exactly. and you're going to look forward to it. Yeah, it's, it's very important to understand how uncomfortable this is going to feel uh, in the very beginning. And it's also very important to understand um, how important it is to create that consistency. You know, if you're checking in quarterly, that means throughout one year, you would have only had four meetings. That's not a large number. Over right. two years, eight. And of course, do you think when things change in your lives dramatically, it would be a good time to check in. But after three years, you're at 12 we're talking years here of consent to build the type of consistency to get the discomfort of these conversations to go away and, and become natural. And the last thing I want to say um, is that again, this isn't easy. You know, if this was easy, everyone would be doing it. Everyone knows that expression. Yeah. Um, this is what's not being done by the vast majority of couples out there. But if you can, if you can go through this and make it a regular practice in your life, the strength in your relationship that you build will be like any, will, will be unlike any other strength, you know, anything else that you've experienced stumbling on my words here. But, um, we, we firmly believe that, you know, this is the pathway to developing a healthy financial relationship, um, in a partnership.